What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network for a reading of the Ethics of Money Production by Jörg Guido Holzmann. Today, the final part in Chapter 4, Utilitarian Considerations on the, on the Production of Money, Part 8, The Cost of Commodity Money. One great disadvantage of natural money, such as gold and silver, seem to be their relative high cost of production. According to a widespread opinion that became popular by the writings of classical economist Adam Smith and David Ricardo, paper money could do the monetary job just as well and at a much lower production cost. It is true that producing a one-ounce silver coin, which we might call one dollar, entails a much higher cost than production of a banknote that bears the same name. But it does not follow that this is necessarily a disadvantage. The natural costs that go hand in hand with producing gold and silver are in fact a supreme reason why these metals are better monies than paper. The fact is that they are costly means that they cannot be multiplied at will. And this in turn means that commodity money such as gold and silver feature, feature a built-in natural insurance against excessively depreciating purchasing power of money. See Wagner in Die Russische Papierwährung, ein volkswirtschaftlich und finanzpolitische Studie, nebst Vorschlägen zur Herstellung der Valuta. That is quite a title. <laughs> the Russian paper currency, a uh, economical and financial political study uh, in accordance to proposals for the creation of uh, valuta, which is the, the uh, time sensitivity of debt. In the crucial respect, oh, wait, sorry, uh, in these pages, the author states that for this reason, paper money is no suitable currency and categorically recommends a return to commodity money, whether paper has been introduced, such as in empirical Russia, Russia of his time. In this crucial respect, they are far superior to paper monetary notes, which can be multiplied at libitium and which, as universal experience shows, have been manipulated and are currently being manipulated in far greater proportion than gold and silver ever have. Hence, the comparison between commodity monies and paper monies should not be cast in too narrow terms. Relevant benefits do not just consist in some arbitrary narrow exchange service, as we have just argued, but include things like guarantees against inflation and the relative costs are not just the cost of fab fabricating the different monetary objects, but total costs entailed by each system. Even the most ardent advocates of paper money have conceded that our current monetary regime is hardly a bargain. For example, consider the central banks and other monetary authorities that have built a huge bureaucracy and that the Fed watching industry, people employed to interpret the forecast, the policy of the monetary authorities are simply uh, similarly important. See Milton Friedman in The Resource Cost of Irredeemable Paper Money. Uh, and compare Friedman's paper with the statements contained by William Goach in A Short History of Paper Money and Banking and the Cost of the Gold Standard of Lou Rockwell. The Gold Standard. Uh, the Federal Reserve System employs a staff of some 23,000. Similarly, the German Bundesbank employs some 11,500 civil servants. And in 2007, the Bank of France, uh, the Bank de France, had some 11,800 civil servants. Yeah, servants for sure. These two, expense, these two expenses for mining and minting look much less costly than Ricardians portray. And notice the irony that mining and minting are still in use in the age of paper money. There is, of course, nothing wrong with experimenting with cheaper alternatives to gold and silver coins. Nothing would prelude uh, such experiments in a free society. All we can say is that in the past, all such experiments have lamentably failed. And the adv advocates of paper money, therefore, hardly ever seriously consider establishing their pet scheme on a comp uh, competitive basis. 
Ricardo and his followers advocated the coercive replacement of more costly goods by cheaper ones. Clearly, in all other spheres of life, we would reject such uh, we, we would reject any such proposals as extravagant and outrageous. We do not coerce all members of society into driving only the cheapest cars because they satisfy some arbitrary conceived transportation need at lower cost. We do not impose rages and hovels on peoples who prefer clothes and houses. Need racks and hovels. Neither is there a reason to impose paper money on those who prefer the money of ages. Thus, another standard justification of paper money does not hold water, and the same demonstration can be delivered for all other economic theories that purport the exa to ex that purport to explain why it should be beneficial to suppress the natural commodity monies and replace them with political makeshift such as paper money. We could go into much length in de delivering these demonstrations. The point of the foregoing pages was to exemplify the general thesis that there is no utilitarian rationale for the institution of paper money, the money of our times. This thesis will serve as a starting point for the following discussion on the various abuses that can be made and which unfortunately have been made in the realm of production of money. Peers, this was part one of the ethics of money production, the natural production of money. Please join me in the future shows uh, to read part two on inflation and eventually uh, part three on monetary order and the monetary system. Thank you very much again for your Guido Holzmann for writing and the Mises Institute for publishing The Ethics of Money Production. Thank you very much and see you on the next show. Bye-bye.